Good evening, staff, faculty, distinguished guests, Mr. Godfrey Smith and wife, our VP, Dr. Enrique Savory, our Dean, Dr. Usher, and our Captain, Dr. Vincent Palacio. I am Erica Aguilar. Welcome. It's good to see a full house. So this event is called Meet the Author. It's hosted by the Faculty of Education and Arts here at University of Belize, and it is aligned with the university's commitment to our students and to our, Belize, and to our country, Belize's development. This is an exciting moment. It truly is, if you love books and letters, if you love writing, it is an excellent moment that you can listen and learn from a very learned Belizean author whose success is in the genre of biography. So I take this opportunity to gently remind you, UB students and high school students, that this event was made possible for you to be exposed and read culturally relevant books. To be exposed and to experience and engage with the author, to listen to his writing journeys, his views about our Belizean society, whether political, legal. We don't know if we want to, if we want to go into the religious part, but you can also ask him questions about that. Okay, but ultimately it is to plant, ultimately it is to plant, hopefully to plant a seed in you in becoming our next future Belizean author. Okay, so please feel free to ask Mr. Smith all your most intriguing questions because I'm sure you have them. You have been asking those in the classroom, so now is the time for you to let those questions out. So to celebrate this moment for the welcome address, I now call on our captain, the president of the University of Belize, Dr. Vincent Palacio. Please let's give him a warm <laughs> welcome. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jaguar Auditorium. Allow me to express my sincere appreciation to the Faculty of Education and Arts, who successfully organized and is hosting this monumental occasion of the first Meet the Arter series. Yes, a round of applause, indeed, in order. <laughs> Mr. Smith, you will go down in our history book as the first author of this uh, series. I was interacting with Miss Casey, and she already have authors lined up for the rest of the year. So this will be a busy series, and I'm looking forward to it. This effort has marked an important principle of celebrating our achievements and successes as Belizeans. To celebrate our accomplishments requires our ability to recognize our capabilities and to appreciate the talents of our people. 
This is an important part of developing a national consciousness that is nurtured in the mindset of success. Today's event provides an opportunity to do just that, to cultivate a mindset of success. This forum, therefore, presents an academic platform that will be used to engage and inspire you future historians, poets, linguists, lawyers, educators, and artists. I hope you find today's presentation to be enriching and enjoyable. I know you didn't come here to listen to me, so I will leave the podium at this point. I thank you again for coming. Do enjoy. Yes, indeed, you're here to listen to the author. So, without any further delay, please, let's give Mr. Smith a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the very generous introduction. President of UB, Vice President, Dean of the Faculty, other distinguished guests, students. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. I note from the poster that this is a part of a series, Meet the Author. So I thought I should talk to you a little bit about who I am. Um, and then get into what I'd like to address you on, which is how I became a writer, which wasn't always the case. I never knew that I had it in me, and in fact, I stumbled upon it. At my stage where you are right now, like third, fourth, or sixth form, I wanted badly, very much, to be a lawyer, and I became a lawyer. I think a fairly successful one, <laughs> but it is not my passion. It is not my passion, it is not what I like to do. It is not a profession I am proud of. In fact, I think it an inferior profession Mainly because, sorry, Mr. President, I know your son just signed up <laughs> to do <laughs> but, So let me read this little passage for you from one of the essays in this book called On Being a Judge. And here I'm talking about why I decided to become a judge. So I say, it is not that I didn't find practicing law to be mentally challenging. It often was, but in the way that solving a difficult crossword puzzle is. Enjoyable, full of wily wordplay and mental acrobatics, but not soul satisfying. If I were any good at mathematics, I suppose I would find it to be like solving abstract math problems. I was always too conscious that the esoteric points I argued in court had little relevance to the society beyond my client's interests. This haunted me like an inexorcisable specter. Occasionally, there were cases of social significance like challenging the criminalization of homosexuality, getting the defense of battered women's syndrome accepted in the courts, and blocking oil exploration in protected areas. But generally, 
I struggled to find meaning in the regular run of cases, even if complex and controversial. Sure, there was the exhilaration of a hard-fought court victory, the triumph of winning, but what was I contributing to improving society? And in my view, not very much as a lawyer. So that's currently who I am. It's not who I want to be, okay? What you do for a living is very different from your passion. And sometimes you never discover it. Well, I mean, look, the society fosters us to think that high school, sixth form, university, just stay on that conveyor belt, success, gain this, gain that. But oftentimes, you never know what you truly want to do until later on in life or until you try different things. If you don't try different things, you never know what you want. Good. So having said that, I am a practicing lawyer. I'm a judge now from time to time because I get so bored stiff with being a lawyer and things move so slow. And I find that as a judge, I'm more in control and I can try to get judgments out quickly and deliver a product to people because that's what they come to court for, for a product. To get something just like at a grocery shop. You pay your money, you pay a lawyer, you go, to, you go to the shop. You want the good delivered to you. Judgment sometimes takes three, four, five years. Sometimes never. You never get the judgment. It's an absolutely insane. Anyhow, so that's why I became a judge. Now, let's uh, come to the point. How did I become a, a writer? And I must say that I, don't con I did not consider myself a writer until after three books. No, that's, that's not necessarily the test because some of you will know that um, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee, I think it was, wrote only one book, I think, maybe a second one. And of course, he's famous forever. Um, but I, I have never felt comfortable r calling myself a writer until I had passed three books. So how did I become a writer? I never knew. I could write or even had an interest. But in preparing for this little talk, sharing with you, I sat and dragged deep into my memory archives, and it took me back to sixth form. Again, pretty much at your level. And I recall that I used to do essays for my friends for English and in philosophy courses, because I liked it. They didn't have to pay me, um, but, but, but I volunteered because I loved the mental exercise of figuring out, and I remember clearly one for my good friend, who is now, I think, a minister of government. Of government. And it was on the question of love, what is love? And I remember concluding something like, love is a decision, but that's not what matters. And then I wrote on other philosophical points, World War II. I just enjoyed. But I should have realized then that I liked critical thinking. I liked to explore ideas, develop the ideas, to see what conclusion it would lead you to. And on that point, let me say, Francis Bacon has this very important saying, I'm only paraphrasing because I don't remember it word for word. But basically he's saying reading is important and it makes the man. Conferencing, meaning dialogue, improves it. But writing make it a precise man or woman, of course. Only by sitting and writing can you actually distill your thoughts. Can you imagine sitting for three or four hours just thinking about something and developing mentally? It's pretty hard, right? I mean, you could probably do it for five or 10 minutes, but after that, you'd bore your own self. But if you have the task of sitting and writing, it makes a difference. So I should have realized from then that I had an interest in writing, but it didn't matter to me. I didn't recognize it as writing then. I just recognized it as having an interest in ideas and developing ideas. And then after sixth form, uh, it was, there was an organization called SPARE, Society for the Promotion of Education and Research. And briefly, they had a newspaper called SPARE Head. And I wrote 
briefly for Sparehead. And, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't like literary writing. It was just like, Spare's objective was to try to, we, here's a big word, conscient, conscientize Belizeans and make them aware of world events and to be questioning and so on. And uh, I did that for a while. And at the point when they wanted to send me to Jamaica to study journalism, I said, no, I wanted to be a, a lawyer because at the time I said that was a rather grand and prestigious thing to do. I always wanted to be a lawyer. So off I went. So again, writing at Spare was a good exposure. When you're a lawyer, oftentimes the politicians come knocking at your door. They want to drag you into politics. So that's what happened to me. The politicians came, knocked on my door, dragged me into politics, kicking and screaming. And I did some writing for a newspaper. I remember having written a few pieces thinking, well, that's not a bad piece at all. I, I remember two or three pieces, but I never again, it was far removed from my mind to consider myself like anything as a writer. After that, I, you would have heard somebody read out my biography where I was a minister for 10 years. And that involved me in minimum writing of like press releases and uh, cabinet press briefings. Again, nothing much to it. But it was, I remember clearly now, in, sorry, I also wrote prime minister's speeches. And now I open my box, my magic box. And here is the first item out of Pandora's box which is my first published work, which is a, a compendium of speeches. But I'll put it away quickly, because it's rather boring for students. And I actually don't count it <laughs> among my publications. Some writers do. But I do not consider compiling speeches a uh, publication. It's not an original work, even though I had a hand in writing some of the speeches. So again, even though I, I had that written and it was published, I didn't consider myself a writer. It was just a publication of speeches. And then came the moment of epiphany. Light bulb goes off. You know, in the comic books, you see light bulb goes off in there. And I was in government. We were making a holy mess of things, complete disaster, complete meltdown. We were being excoriated and berated all over the place. And I remember going to Valerie, my wife, and saying, you know, I, I have an urge to write on a regular basis about what's wrong and what needs to be done. And I hope she doesn't mind my saying it, but she was at first alarmed and said, but you will get into trouble for the things you want to say. And here comes the first lesson of being a writer. You cannot be afraid of saying the things you want to say if you believe it. First lesson. So I didn't think about that for a moment. But now, in terms of what I consider my first real publication, which is this piece of work, this is really the, the life story. I hope my political friends, Mr. President, don't get upset with me, but the only political figure in Belize worth writing about, George Price. The rest you can throw in the, the rubbish bin. Um, Price, now, I remember when it first occurred to me that I should do something about price. I was at the bookstore on the University of the West Indies campus in about the year 1992. I was a law student. I went into the bookshop, and I saw a biography of Michael Manley. And I picked it up, looked at it, flipped through it, and said, but surely something should be done about Belize's most formidable well-known 
political figure. And so that led to price. After that, look at how coincidences work in life. I don't think I thought about doing anything else. But somehow the book, this price book, fell into the hands of a lady who's actually come to this university and spoken to students about something called Federation. Um, Rachel Manley, the daughter of perhaps the Caribbean's most famous prime minister, a legend called Michael Manley. And she had read Price, and somehow, coincidentally, we met. She was on a visit to Belize. Through a mutual friend, she came to my house, and leaning on my kitchen counter, she said, would you consider a biography of my father? Because I read what you did on Price, and I think you would do justice to him. And of course, being bored stiff practicing law, I jumped at the opportunity. And I took on the task of working on my second publication, which is Michael Manley, the biography. Now, students, let me not fool you. You know, these are boring covers. Uh, it's kind of heavy reading, you know, but still. The, the latest book, of course, has a beautiful, nice, interesting cover. So late in the day, I realize it's, it's the cover that matters, you know? It's, <laughs> it's not <laughs> more, more than anything else. So after Manly, um, so just so for, for the would-be writers in terms of how long it takes and time span, this was 2011, the first. The second was 2016, so that's like five years. And, um, and then the third, because I, I, I'm in love with revolutionary figures, people, people who want to make a change, who take risks, who go on the line. Like you, I'm bored with just boring people, you know? You, if you yourself are boring, you're bo you don't want to read about boring people. So Price was a revolutionary uh, of his own. Manley was definitely a revolutionary. And this guy from Grenada, called Maurice Bishop, was a, revolu a revolutionary. He and others achieved the first, you hear about the Cuban Revolution and the Russian Revolution. The only revolution in the English-speaking Caribbean was by Maurice Bishop. So I thought about it for a while, but I needed to get to Grenada and look how coincidences work again. I became a judge, um, bored with things in Belize. I was sent to the Eastern Caribbean, which is a number of countries. I was in St. Lucia for a while, and one day the Chief Justice said, look, um, we have a shortage in Grenada. Would you like to go? I don't think she understood. She could never understand what that meant to me. And so they put me up, listen to this carefully. It was the best time of my life. They put me up at a Radisson on Grand Anse Beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in the entire Caribbean. I don't have to pay a cent. I have to put out my judgments, but I could write. I could research. It was the closest I've ever come to understanding the life of a pure writer, which is just to sit, think, research, and write. So it was just plain beautiful, and that resulted in the assassination of Maurice Bishop, which I think is, a high, is more readable than the other two because the natural story is so dramatic. It's full of murder, assassination, betrayal, power, hatred, love, everything naturally. I'm not making it up. So it lends, that lends itself to what we call a novelesque kind of story. It's not a novel, but it reads like one. And then, finally, we come to the, what the Belizeans love because it's full of stories and gossip about other people. <laughs> the diary of a recovering politician. Look at that cover. So guess what I did? I went to a young student like you all 
she's studying graphic art at some fancy university in New York. And I said, look, these boring covers just won't cut it anymore. Uh, we need to do something nice. And she said, well, what kind of mood do you want to evoke? And I said, boy, politics was such a rough business. I, I imagine a bleak, desolate, dreary landscape with a sorrowful figure trudging the streets after he's had the ass beaten out of him by some other political opponent. He's feeling sorry for him himself walking along the streets, and this is what she produced. And, I, and it's, it's been met with great reviews from everybody. So, and so they say don't judge a book by the cover, right? But I couldn't resist in the acknowledgments to say at the end, please do judge the book by Anya Marshalek's brilliant mood-setting cover artwork. So that's what's, in the, that's what's in the magic book. You know, I'm serious when I say that this is a, this is a treasure chest because some people collect jewelry, some collect shoes, a lot of shoes, some collect watches, boxes of watches, all sorts of things. I have no interest in those things. My treasure is the amount of books that I write and hope to write before I'm dead. I keep reminding myself, like, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your lifespan is like wrong 80 or so on the road to my lady on the Western Highway, I've already jumped Camalote, so there's not a whole lot of wrong left, you know. <laughs> I, 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 have to speed up my, I have to speed up my writing. So, a little bit about the writing process then, for those of you who would want to write. As I mentioned, I stumbled upon it. But if you're interested in writing, obviously, the key is to write, to not be afraid. At first, you won't want to share it with anybody. And I can confess this openly. Every time I write, up to the present, I am full of trepidation anxiety, sometimes fear. I ask myself, but is it even, what you're doing, is it worth it? Does it add anything? Will anybody want to read it? Why am I doing this? Why am I spending countless hours writing this down? Uh, but you get past it, and, and you, you, know, you, you are obviously submitted to other people to look at. Each book that I've written, except the last, has taken approximately, let's say, two years. 18 months is a little shy of two years. Lots of work goes into research. So if you want to write about something, even if you travel, right, even people who write fiction, which I hope to do someday, but don't think I have the necessary skills yet, it's based on your experiences. And in, even when you're having the experiences, you have to make notes or research. You have to immerse yourself in the subject matter of what you want to write about. Whether it's eating ice cream, whether it's fishing, whether it's a ride on a river, you actually have to sit, think about it, make notes of all the details so you can bring it to life for other people. And after you've immersed yourself enough, at some point that little beeping will start go off and you will know that I'm tired of researching. I am now ready to try to put it into writing. So that's, that's basically the writing process. With this last one, Diary of a Recovering Politician, it is, it is an accumulation of writings. Remember I said to you, when I had my crisis as a politician, I went to my wife and said, I, I, I want to start writing. That began in 2006. And so I've drawn on some of those Naturally, in selecting which ones I'll put in here, I threw much of it in the trash bin. There's nothing wrong with that. What you write 10 years, 15 years ago, when you read it later, unless you're exceptional, you might say, well, did I really say that? <laughs> did I really write that? 
There's nothing wrong with that. It reflects your growth. You should never remain static, right? A human being grows, gets new information, new experiences, which changes your thinking, informs your thinking. So you change. So I looked at the whole thing and I trashed most of them. I took a handful and I embellished them. I cheated a bit, actually. Because when you look at the essays, you'll see them have the year stamps, like 20, 2007, 2009, wherever. It's true that the original was written then. But uh, with the benefit of deeper experience, I kind of embellished it a bit. I, I, I developed, expanded, but I kept the time stamp. Um, and then, of course, I think the better ones, like... The better ones, like the billionaire who befriended me, the room where it happened, the God conversations on being a judge and others are a very recent vintage, like the past two years. And um, I think that demonstrates the point that you should improve. If you keep writing and trying with practice, you improve your writing. And so this is less, writing a biography is good. It teaches you a lot about your subject matter, about your own thoughts. Try not, of course, in writing biographies. Well, there are two schools of thought. Some people like to comment heavily on the subject matter. I prefer to just try to resurrect the person and the events and not comment. Because who cares about my opinion? Everybody has their opinion. But there are others who say, no, the reader wants to share what you think. I try to not get myself involved in the life of the individual or the circumstances that I'm writing about. But as I said, this one is a bit different. And I enjoyed it because in writing personal essays, I had the freedom to soar. I can't make up stuff about historical people, right? You have to stick with the facts. But in writing about your own experiences, you're free to, to employ literary devices. You're free to run and jump and soar off that cliff and let your imagination take you because it's your personal writing. And I really enjoyed that. And I think it has whetted my appetite to, um, to try, perhaps, for a novel, which I think is the most supreme form of writing because it requires such originality, such imagination. One of the reasons I wanted to address a bit about critical thinking. You might ask, there are like 23 essays in here on a whole range of different things. Some just about travel experiences, some about politics, some about religious taboo topics, uh, some about culture, governance, and so on. Why did I write them to begin with? Critical thinking, which should be of uh, great importance to students at your level. I write because it feeds my critical thinking and my critical writing. So I sit and I have an idea about something, or I have a complaint about something, or I have a problem with a certain issue, and so I write. You sit, you think about it, but only by sitting and distilling your thoughts do you come to your own view, do you discover the arguments for and against, and do you come to a conclusion? So critical thinking is very important. And I think the, mo the greatest value of this book, some of the essays, not all, some are just relating my experience, but some really challenge established thinking. And some really annoy a lot of people. And, um, but as I said, you shouldn't be afraid to express your views once they're genuinely held. So I think I'll pause there. I'm not sure how long I've spoken and what the time limit is, but I'm conscious that when I was where you're sitting, I was generally bored.
beyond belief with people who just sat and banged on, on and on. So I think critical part of a, an, a, a conversation with an author must be questions. So I, I invite any and all questions you may have on what's in the book, if you've read it, what's not in the book, or anything else. Ms. Aguilar, thank you. Have I kicked something out of place? We are now moving into the question and answer session, and that session is going to be facilitated by our very own Miss Casey. Please raise your hand. Miss Casey is going to let you have your time with the mic. So while people find their courage then, uh, let me try to spur you on by doing exactly what I was asked not to do by Ms. Aguilar, which is to touch on taboo topics, right? So, the, so there is, while you find your courage to ask a question, any question of any kind, um, the more difficult, the better. Um, there's a piece in this book called The God Conversations. And you, got, you know God is a very huge deal, right? The biggest deal of all. And I once entered into a debate with friends about greatness and what makes a person great. And most said, well, Jesus Christ is the greatest person who ever lived and walked the earth. Why? Because he bled and died to take away the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Can you imagine that? That's a hell of a, feat, hell of a sacrifice, isn't it? But I disagreed that it was any kind of sacrifice at all. In fact, I thought it was plain bogus. And here's why. Inevitably, Jesus Christ was suggested as the ultimate emblem of greatness. The pa exemplar. He who suffered and died to take away the sins of humanity must rank as the greatest man, God incarnate, to have ever lived. But two flies were stuck in that doctrinal ointment. First, Jesus had no choice in the matter. He couldn't say no since all the sorrowful scenes in the act were scripted by God, his Father, and he had to play them out. If he did not fulfill that role, he would have been irrelevant and there would have been no New Testament and no Christianity to win souls for God, his Father. Second, and more importantly, it couldn't amount to much of a sacrifice since he knew in advance he was the Son of God. He had to have known in advance that on the third day after his crucifixion, the stone would roll away, he would rise from the dead, emerge from the tomb fit as a fiddle, and ascend bodily into heaven a few weeks later to be seated at the right hand of God. He had to have known this because he was the incarnation of God, the second of three persons of the Trinity. Hell, if I knew I was the Son of God, who would not stay dead after being killed, be memorialized in the best-selling book of all time, the Bible, and worshipped by millions and billions for millennia, I would gladly wear the crown of thorns, hang on the old wooden cross at Calvary, and hardly consider it a sacrifice. So, that, that, that is having the courage to express your conviction. If you believe it, you may disagree. You write your own version. If you so wish, I am writing mine. Any questions, or should okay, I read we another have, passage? Okay, we have one over this right. side. Right. Where are we? That, that, however, is, people might call it blasphemy, but let me assure you, at this stage of where you are in life, that is what you should be questioning and thinking about every subject matter and any. Question everything at all times, even your own beliefs. And there is nothing wrong if you adopt the scientific method of knowing your belief is only, what you think right now is only as good as the data you have to support it. If tomorrow it changes, your views change. There's nothing wrong with that. That basically is the scientific method. 
nothing wrong with changing your views based on whatever the information is. All right, go, go ahead, Ms. Well, what do you think is the greatest issue that we face as a country, and what do you think are future potential issues that we need to prepare ourselves for? Oh, boy, that's a really hard one. Um, I, I, I think the greatest issue surely must be um, people's quality of life and their ability to, to cope with life, to educate their children, to access health, and to have a decent standard of living. Um, and future issues, that will remain the same for a very long time, because I don't think uh, politicians have the, the courage to make meaningful and deep change. So that will continue to be the case, at least until I'm dead, I think. Yes, next question. So you express that we're supposed to speak our truth when writing. My question is, have you gotten into trouble for speaking your truth? Yes, I have in the past. Um, in, writing, in writing this one, the first one, there is somewhere in there where I said that the great George Price took money from the Guatemalans which in fact he did. Now, all for, for, for decades, for decades, the PUP, which is his party, had denied it. Why? Because there's always the issue of the Guatemala claim and people go crazy when they hear Guatemala. What? You detect money from the Guatemalans? And so Price told me, yes, I took it, but I didn't put it in my pocket. It was to fight the British for independence. There was nothing wrong with it. Of course, he only conceded this and confided this to me in his 90s or late 80s when he had not many people to talk to and he was ready to talk. Before that, he was a legend for being completely closed and private. So I just met him at the right time. So I got into trouble because those who thought they were his protectors mm -hmm. said to me, and this is in the essays, you have to, we represent George Price you have to deliver a copy of the book to us immediately. Hmm. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. And threats were sent and so on. And then in relation to the second one, Michael Manley, again, money that one, troublesome thing. Manley was in opposition and he was, a good he was a socialist and he was a good friend of Fidel Castro. And when he was in opposition, you know, you don't have access to money anymore. And so the Cuban government arranged for him to get regular money. But one of his children, not Rachel, my friend, was deeply offended and said, that shouldn't be in the book. We don't want it in there. That he wasn't taking it for himself. He had to take it to, to run his party. And, um, of course, the assassination of Maurice Bishop, um, it didn't quite get me in the same trouble, but to get to the assassins, the people who killed him, I had to do a dirty deed, which is to pretend that I was on their side and understood and could empathize with how it happened. And so little by little, they revealed things to me and I got certain key confessions. And then I turned around and called it the assassination of Maurice. And I said, how could you do that? How could you call it an, assass an assassination? It wasn't, that wasn't how it happened. And they were quite annoyed, but that was the truth of it. And um, in relation to the, the last one, well, I think the, <laughs> the jury is still out, but I did get a couple calls from certain ministers who said, what you're saying is a lie, basically. That wasn't how it happened, but that was how I recollected it. So yes, Miss, um, yes. You do get into some trouble, and you have to be strong and convicted about it to, to write your truth, you know. Make sure your truth, people like going around, say, I'll speak my truth, but make sure it's grounded on facts, of course, <laughs> and on real things. You can't just go around speaking truth because you think it's the truth. It has to be based on facts and reality, not just some supposed truth, right? Yeah. Thank you. Our next question um, is, if you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? Right. I think if I could tell my younger writing self anything, 
it would be to, to write even more. Um, even now, a good writer should be writing every day. Or sorry, not a good writer. Somebody who is serious about writing should be writing every day. Um, two key things. Read nonstop. Gather information nonstop of any kind. Oh, oh. Very nice to you never you. know. Very nice to because the mind I'm told by the scientists is such that it needs a lot of exercise so that the connections can be made. And you never know. So, so, so it's a matter of reading everything, anything, experiencing many different things, even things you're not necessarily interested in. Because as all of that information amasses, it makes you into a very knowledgeable person. And knowing, having knowledge and information makes you better able to criticize and to apply critical thinking and analysis. So, message to my younger self, read voraciously, yes. write voraciously, yes. open yourself to experiences, do not be narrow-minded, and question every single thing, even your most prized and precious beliefs. Okay, um, thank you for being here, and um, you're the only thing that has brought me back to UB's doors. <laughs> in recent times and it really is a pleasure being among my colleagues again but to hear you share from your treasure trove I love the fact that it is a literary tapestry that features these Caribbean icons and so I commend you but for those of us of course we live through the Grenadian Revolution, and I was just sharing with my colleague that I bled when Cord and the other counter-revolutionaries assassinated Maurice. Um, I, it hurt me. Uh, literally, I felt like if it was my brother who was assassinated. We felt it so deeply. But for those of us who didn't live through it, they may know Manly because everybody in the Caribbean knows Jamaica. And of course, they know our Belizean icons. But who, what about Maurice touched you that would whet their appetite? So it's going to be a book in my book club coming up when my turn comes again. But for those who don't know Maurice, what about him, that person, drew you to write about him? I think as I might have hinted at, the same with Manley and Price. He was a transformational figure. So I'm drawn, perhaps because I wasn't one, and perhaps will never be one. If, if, I, if I'm to live a worthless life, I might as well write about worthwhile people and make that be my contribution if I can't be one myself. So I was drawn to Bishop because he was transformational. He was a lawyer, but he cast that aside and essentially gave his life to, to make change. Sadly, cut way too short, way too quickly. One of the saddest episodes in the history of the Caribbean. But that's what drew me to him. His courage, his magnetism, because all these figures are also very charismatic people. Sadly, and this is an interesting point for biographers, I never met, well, I met Price, but I never met Manley or Bishop. So what I had to do was to collect every audio and video that existed and spend hours and endless hours immersing myself watching it until I felt a part of it that I could, I dreamt about them often at night because I was so immersed in it and I could feel and hear them and so that enables you to, to help to resurrect them. Thank you. We have a question over this side. What, what, what is your point of view of Belize's corruption, political corruption, nowadays and back then, like back in your days? Political corruption? Yes, sir. Uh, I think that's an easy one. It's shouldn't be. You, you elect politicians to make change, to improve your life. 
And I think, no, it has not escaped any government. Uh, you can read about it as it related to me in this book, in the essay called The Room Where It Happened. And all too often, um, it's what brings governments down. It's what they campaign against to say, when we get in, we will make it different. But invariably, it's never different. And I think that will be with us again. Sadly, I'm a realist. It will be with us for quite some time, if not indefinitely. You had a question, sir. Why don't you just read it? Um, I wanted to ask, which one of your um, works is your favorite? Which one are you most proud of? Yes. Which one am I most proud of? Um, you know, don't think me cheeky, but if you've had several girlfriends in your life, <laughs> you know, the one who is the current is the best. <laughs> and the one you had, the first one, that was the best. So I honestly think I'm not trying to be cheeky, but when I think about them, each time I did one, I thought, oh, that one is the one I like the best. And I can honestly say this last one, because it gave me such freedom to express myself. I wasn't hitched to the wagon of history. I didn't have to ensure it. I wasn't making things up or embellishing history on the lives of important people. I could actually write and soar. So for right now, for right now, this one is my, my favorite. <laughs> so. Go ahead. Okay, a pleasant good evening to everybody. Um, I want to first of all um, compliment the UV Jaguars and the UV team for putting something like this together. <laughs> it's long overdue. Um, and institutions like this supposed to be doing things like this. So um, congrats to UV. Um, second of all, I want to um, compliment you on your achievement um, because I think you have put us on the map um, regionally, okay? So people always think that um, it has to come from another Caribbean country. And even myself growing up as, as a high school student, I'm a, a teacher of history, I always feel that um, we are not in, we are not at par with the other, with our, our Caribbean um, colleagues. So you have proven that we can do, we we can fit in, and we are as good as they are. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, now to my question: If you were to choose another Belizean to write on at this time, who would that be? Boy, you really put me on. <laughs> But since I stood before you and say you must have the courage of your beliefs, the honest answer is no one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, I thought about, about, about it, but it's not enough. I'd have to do it, him in conjunction with Forbes Burnham. But I, I went to the archives there, and sadly, because of the, the intense ethnic divisions, the archives is in a sad mess. There's nothing. When one party gets in, they wipe out information on the other part. Yeah. Sad, sad, sad. Nothing. Nothing at all. Yeah. Yes. How have you gotten over those periods of having writer's block? Actually, that's a good question. I didn't remember it. With this one, Bishop, I sat for months in St. Lucia with writer's block. And I, I just sat and stared at the sea and nothing came. Nothing came. Um, but you just have to persist. You just have to stay with it and not give up, which is true for everything in life. The Chinese say that the journey of a thousand miles begin with the first step. And it's so true. I remember with Price, the very first, 
I remember just being so happy that I finished the first page. And before you know it, one chapter is finished, then another and another, and so it goes. So I'm getting the message now. Um, <laughs> Well, that's, that's fine. So, so um, yes, you have to persist. Stick with it. And listen, regardless of whatever field you are in, when you're faced with a problem or something that you want to resolve, if you sit and think about it long enough, you will begin to find doors unlocking so when the front row goes is when I go, Mr. President. <laughs> so. we, we, uh, we have an arrangement with the high schoolers. No, no, I'm, I'm Their time joking. is up. When, so. Whenever you say We have another, um, perhaps the final question for our session today. Um, hello. How has your experiences of being a minister, a lawyer, and a judge influenced your writing and ideologies? Influenced my writing? And ideologies as well. All right. Um, good. It gives me the material to write. So remember I said earlier, the more experiences you have, the better. But if you're a person who just stay closed up in a room and go nowhere, discuss with no one, just maybe watch TV, <laughs> you won't have much things to draw on. I never forget the great writer listening to the great writer the late John Le Carré, famous for maybe 30 brilliant spy novels, listening to him at the Hay Festival in Wales, saying that his resource was ad adverse experiences he'd had in childhood. A father who was a criminal in jail, all kinds of bad things that happened to him, gave him the material to write. So don't pamper your kids too much. It's very good to have adverse experiences because it, it creates character. It makes you engage, have experiences. Difficult situations and scenarios in life are very, very important. And you should go out of your way to put yourself in difficult situations if you want to have an interesting life. Otherwise, what a sad, boring life it could be. I have a question. Uh, you've written, you said you've written about great people, right? Um, I was wondering if you'd stick to that type or would you write about people who are not so great but need recognitions for not so great things they do? Um, well, you have to have left something worthwhile to write about. Otherwise, I'll be bored stiff writing about you and people will be bored stiff reading what I write. So one of the key is to find something interesting. The person doesn't have to be great, but must have lived, must have done something interesting, right? I mean, if it's not interesting, just sum it up in a fact sheet. You know, it's not worth a book. Not everything is worth a book, you know. Not everything is worth a book. Not everybody is worth a book. So yes, it, you don't have to be a great individual, but. There must be something interesting and worthwhile. And if it's written about already, you have to ask yourself, what new am I contributing or adding? Otherwise, it's not worth it to just regurgitate what somebody else has done. I hope that answers the question. Maybe. Yes, um, good afternoon. So my colleague here was asking me this question, so I thought, the best person to ask is you, no? obviously. Uh, you named the book The Diary of a Recovering Politician. Um, and she was asking, what do you mean by a recovering politician? Is, like, is it like the experience like a bad hangover? Um, I know the book looks like definitely um, you're implying that it's uh, uh, quite an experience. No? But what, what do you mean by recovery of a politician? Oh, it's just, a mar it's just a marketing technique. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let me do justice to your question. <clears throat> I'm not a recovering politician. I am recovered a long time. I left politics in... When did I get my ass whipping? 
2008. I have not looked back and will not look back. I take the view that your life is comprised of many different chapters. My political life were a few chapters, but there are many other things to do, and I'm doing it. So I'm not recovering, but I thought it would sound pretty interesting to say that area for recovering politician. Truth be told. <laughs> so. All right, that brings us to the end of our Q&A. We'll turn it over now to our MC, Ms. Aguilar. We're now proceeding into the presentation of the poster where I'm gonna call on our Dean, Dr. Usher, to present uh, Mr. Smith with his poster. This poster is a token of appreciation and remembrance of this very, very historic moment. Thank you very much. And now I call on Mr. Delmer Sabe, who is going to give the closing remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you for such a passionate presentation. I think you can still feel the spirit in the auditorium. Jose Mujica once said, I am the son of my history. Mr. Godfrey Smith's presentation today and his book tells accounts and reflections of his life. The burning passion inside him led him to write accounts that traverse various themes that relate directly to the Belizean reality. How do you remember your past? What meanings do you find in your past? I am sure Mr. Smith grappled with what to include, what to omit, and how to tell each of these accounts. The product has literary and historical value. On behalf of the Faculty of Education and Arts, the students and administrators, I would like to once more thank you, Mr. Smith, for joining us. It is of great pleasure that we have hosted you and I am sure that the students got inspired and will be inspired by your production. I also want to extend my deepest gratitude to the students who joined us today to be inspired, to learn, and to question. Thank you. Please stay back to socialize a little bit. We have some snacks to the back and books that you may want to take this opportunity to have the author sign. Thank you for being here.